Welcome to this audio lecture for Musculoskeletal 2. The topic we're going to discuss today is uh, about the vertebral artery and we're going to just try to present the evidence that's available uh, about this um, particular anatomical structure and how it relates to being a musculoskeletal practitioner who would be working potentially on patients with cervical spine problems and what we should know about this and we're just going to try to kind of clear up some of the myths um, that are out there and understand the evidence that is there so we're an informed consumer about both the good and uh, maybe the risks that are involved with uh, working in this area. Before we examine this issue of cervical manipulation and its risk of potential stroke we maybe need to look at the history uh, behind this. And I think the short version is this, that chiropractors probably, especially in the early 1900s, were um, not following a lot of scientific connotations in their work. They weren't, they weren't the first to like really um, get into some of the scientific principles of medicine. And so they were treating folks in a really loose manner in some cases, a very unscientific manner and, a, and maybe even an unsafe manner. Uh, MDs, medical doctors, they didn't really like doctors of osteopath at first. Now those two disciplines are kind of um, indistinguishable from one another. Uh, but then they turned their, MDs turned their focus to um, chiropractors and basically deemed that profession as being undisciplined, uh, unscientific, unscrupulous, and, and potentially unsafe. And so I think what you really have here though is a conflict that, are, that was, is it manipulation that's unsafe or were just the practitioners performing a largely manipulation-based practice unsafe. Um, they all came to the head in the 70s. The chiropractor sued the AMA. They won the lawsuit uh, but were rewarded basically nothing, like a dollar or something, uh, saying that they didn't, it didn't harm them, the fact that the, the MDs tried to put them out of business. Um, so I think what you really need to understand is, is MDs, and maybe to a lesser degree us as physical therapists, looked at chiropractors as not very good practitioners, not very scientific practitioners, uh, I think there was truth to some of that. Uh, I think there um, is less and less of that distinction probably as far as like, I think chiropractors have moved away from some of the, the really bad unscientific treatments, but you'll still see some of that out there. Um, there are some physical therapists doing things like cranial sacral therapy that's really questionable about its validity. So it will, no one's like completely uh, clean of that, but... I think what you really need to understand is that perhaps manipulation got really the, the bad reputation it did because it was largely associated with chiropractors. And so uh, now we need to really go back and look at manipulation again and say, is you know it safe? And I, I think the general rule is yes, it is. And it's certainly a preferred treatment for low back pain, especially acute low back pain. Uh, the neck is a, a trickier area, and it certainly has posed some uh, conflict. We just want to examine it and say, is it based on science or is this based on maybe um, the desire to label some of these things as unsafe because they were associated with clinicians that were sort of doing haphazard things. Again, changes in our profession have really occurred. Like I, when I graduated 20 years ago, manipulation was viewed in sort of a negative light that it would cause you hypermobility. Uh, it could potentially cause stroke, things like that. Um, now, when I go to coursework, um, no matter what the discipline is, it, you know, I'm hearing this discussion of uh, manipulation. And um, it is, I mean, I think it has completely become mainstream. And it, it, is, it is looked at as a preferred treatment. Uh, it's a standard of care for low, acute low back pain. Uh, thoracic spinal manipulations are recommended for neck pain and shoulder pain. Cervical spine manipulations we, we presented in musculoskeletal too are have some evidential support that they can help things like lateral epicondyalgia. Uh, 
uh, and upper cervical manipulation is advocated for treating headaches and, and temporal mandibular joint problems. So uh, it's one of those situations where um, I think the views have changed. We're still, though, in some conflict when it comes to the neck about the safety of that. And that's what we went and examined. We'll look here at what the American Physical Therapy Association statement on uh, joint manipulation. This came out uh, somewhere in the the late 2000s here, so 2019 or 2009. So it said that yes, I mean there is good evidence and that therapists can perform manipulation safer. This was actually kind of in in, in some ways uh, in an argument that chiropractors were starting to make that they should be the ones doing manipulation and that the therapist shouldn't. And the APTA certainly came out with its statement saying that no, therapists can perform manipulations just as safe as chiropractors, that we're doing more to establish evidence-based frameworks. Uh, and so I think, again, the American Physical Therapy Association is quite on board with you learning uh, how to do cervical manipulation uh, or cervical thrust um, joint thrust manipulations. It's just, again, whether or not you are aware of and follow good guidelines to make sure you're trying to eliminate the potential risks that might be associated with this. So when you look at all the different uh, individuals that are providing education in this area, you'll see a large um, number of these folks, everyone from the American Academy of Orthopedic Manual Physical Therapists, to NIOP, to AIOM, um, to Ola Grimsey's Institute, um, there's Orthopedic Manual Physical Therapy Fellowships, uh, there's the Spinal Manipulation Institute for Manipulative Therapy uh, that's out there. So a large number of folks who are advocating the usage of this within our own practition or with our own, own um, field. And so it's one of those situations where I really do feel like uh, there is support that physical therapists should be able to do this skill. And um, so I don't think this is some stretch for Dr. Bond and I to be teaching you this skill set um, because it is something that has become quite mainstream. Here is a uh, just a, a slide on uh, the cervical spine that I created off of uh, our uh, anatomosh table and uh, you can play this and look at uh, some of the structures um, that are that are in there I mean anytime I think we look at the anatomy review we'll see this and I point out in this some of the structures that we uh, are interested in the vertebral artery and how it courses up through the neck and we we want to remember how that has those curvatures and changes from um, C1 and C2 up to, to into the frame and magnum. So this vertebral artery does supply about 20% of the blood to our brain. It originates from the subclavian. Um, and this vertebral basilar artery system consists of the two uh, vertebral arteries and, and that one basilar artery and how they join together right up here as they enter into our brain. So it has a proximal transverse and a suboccipital portion. That suboccipital portion is it uh, kind of torturously turns to go up into the, the frame and magnum. That's where we do think there may be some vulnerability to this. And then there is, is a portion up into the intracranial portion of the skull. So again, when we look at the suboccipital portion, the one that we think has the most vulnerability, it, it uh, extends from its exit at the axis of C2 to the point of its penetration into the spinal canal. And that's, that portion of the suboccipital is also then divided into another smaller four parts. Um, one, the first part between the transverse foramen of C2, and then the second part between C2 and C1. And the third in the transverse foramen of C1, uh, that small hole that comes out of the top um, cervical vertebrae, and then between the posterior arches of the atlas and its entry into that foramen magnum. So we think the vertebral artery is vulnerable to some things like compression and stretch. 
um, at levels of, of cervical rotation. Um, this is debated. I mean, we are not able to... We first of all don't have the number of subjects to really look at this because it, it is not a common feature to have um, some sort of problem in this area. But a lot of people are not signing up to have something done to their neck to see how it would respond to this. That wouldn't be approved by research ethics boards. Um, but we do think there may be the possibility of things like ossifications of this atlanto-occipital membrane, potentially putting another bony barrier along this course of the vertebral artery. Maybe that's problems. Uh, maybe if, if the C1 transverse mass moves during rotation excessively, that could put stress on the vertebral artery. And maybe even just extending the cervical spine um, at those uh, cervical vertebral joints might you know, impact this artery negatively. Again, you're going to read discussions about this. I don't really see any consensus on the ability for this to happen, though, because you'll have studies that, that basically look at this, and we'll talk about them later, that this is maybe not possible for this artery to do some of the things it's claimed to do. Okay, this is a study um, that just kind of looked at the overview of um, the implications of manual therapy or manip manipulative therapy being uh, implicated in problems for cervical arterial dissection. And the, again, the idea that this vertebral artery um, becomes somehow transected, split, torn, uh, or injured internally to a point where it, it has um, some sort of stroke-like event. And the, the four mechanisms are that, that maybe the actual force of a manipulative thrust could actually damage the vertebral or artery walls. Uh, the second is that the person is having a dissection already from some innocuous or perhaps even... Um, internal cause. It's, it's, it's something in their arterial structure that failed or their genetics. And then they come to a practitioner with neck pain. That practitioner does a manipulation to address that neck pain and then propagates or worsens this dissection. Um, there's thoughts that maybe just the positions we put people into these manipulative procedures may alter blood flow in some way. And then um, the idea that perhaps we do a manipulative thrust that doesn't really like damage the artery, but it causes it to have a vasospasm, and that could alter blood flow to the brain and lead to a stroke. So those are some of the theories. Again, none of these really have gained any traction from a, a, an actual ability to prove causation or connections. Okay, so there are some studies that, that would tend to debunk at least three of those theories. So there are both dog and animal studies in which examiners really couldn't, they tried to produce these vertebral uh, artery dissections, the CAD, uh, cervical arterial dissections, uh, and they couldn't. Um, there are also cadaver studies that showed that it would require a way more greater forces than those capable of being produced by manipulation. So the, the one that I've always heard the most frequently is that if you with, with stood a car wreck, that there's no way you know a manipulation would exceed the forces you withstood in that event. Um, so there is the, the conclusion perhaps that manipulation is unlikely forceful enough to cause damage to normal arteries. Um, and so then that the only one that it doesn't rule out is the fact that maybe some of these folks are having a stroke in progress. We just are the unlucky practitioner perhaps that might be um, seeing them at that time. And if we were to ignore or not catch the signs of the stroke, then perhaps we would be contributing to its worsening. Uh, 
So that's what we were just talking about here, the stroke in progress is the most likely theory that we have that we just don't catch these people and there's no, t there's no way to know if they were having the stroke before or after the procedure. And so certainly doing this to somebody who's having um, some susceptibility in their artery could increase the rate or um, worsen the progression of that, that dissection, that idea that the artery sort of opens or tears apart. So again, when we look at these um, manipulation studies, um, that we really see that there probably is less of a causation factor and instead more of a complicating factor. And so really the thing we'd like to know is how do we keep from missing these signs uh, rather than trying to really just say, hey, manipulation is dangerous, it shouldn't be done in the neck. How do we better screen for these folks? I like these two quotes. Um, this one, basically, the, the first one, this uh, Sunzi, the art of war, saying basically, if you don't know your enemy and you don't know yourself, you're you're probably in an, you know a bad spot. And so, you know, my my analogy to this is, if you're a clinician out here who doesn't do manipulation and who doesn't know the evidence on manipulation, it is very easy for those individuals to say that is a risky procedure. And I think you will come across that. You'll come across like acute care physical therapists that don't know how to do it and they don't know much about it, but they would, they would say, well, I would never do that. And that has a lot of risk. I came across a nurse who said she treated patients who had had strokes from chiropractors. And I don't think she knows the literature. Like when I talked to her about it, she was just implying that these people who were having a stroke had seen a chiropractor. So um, I don't think that's based on science. Uh, having said that, I think if you are a clinician that is going to do this skill, you better know full well the risk you're, you're entertaining, the, the factors that we can support as far as detection, and you better stay up to date about whether this is continued to be supported. Uh, if, if I find out tomorrow that manipulation risks are seen as high or risky or um, something that is scientifically proven to cause or, or link to, then I, I'm, I'm going to quit doing that. But uh, that's not really what's out here right now. And so it's one of those situations where I think there is some misinformation and I think it's important vital for us as clinicians to really know what's going on, know the risk, and then also be able to, you know, make more educated decisions, not just ones based around kind of um, old information or uh, information that's kind of laced with some of this uh, clinician-based resentment, clinician-based um, kind of turf wars, things like that. Here's Warren Buffett's quote that... Uh, uh, risk com comes from not knowing what you're doing. And I think that really sums it up pretty well, you know, in the sense if you don't know what you're doing, either way on this stuff, you can get yourself in trouble. Okay, here's old Mark Twain's uh, quote says, uh, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble, it's what you know for sure that just isn't so. And so I think that, you know, I, I extend that to myself from the standpoint of like, if I think manipulation is great because I've done it for the last 15 years and I've had all these great outcomes, that still doesn't mean that I am scot-free from continuing to look at and examining this issue critically. That's all anecdotal information. My clinical history with that procedure is, is not uh, absolute. And so it's one of those situations where I think we're, we're obligated as clinicians to stay up to date on this stuff. So first of all, we ought to consider how common is this uh, condition. And there's a lot of variability in the research, and you'll see this out here. So um, again, I think take these numbers and let's put them in some perspective. So the numbers range from somewhere in maybe 1 in 6 to 10 million manipulations uh, to maybe 1 in 100,000. 
Um, so I, I think what you see there is that is a vastly different number. And um, if that is one in six million, I think that's a risk I will accept because I think there's a lot of benefit that does come from this intervention. If the risk is one in 100,000, that's probably not worth taking. And so um, I think here's what you have to understand though. There's a lot famous lawsuit out of Canada in which a, a woman sued uh, a chiropractor for stroke induced problems. And the stroke itself happened some 20 days after her treatment. And again, so the question becomes causation. Did that cause it or was that just somehow in the same vicinity? You know, and in 20 days, I, I wouldn't say is, is that's too long uh, of a time to say that those two events were, were linked. So again, when we, we think about this, I mean, this is scary. You know, you're not trying to, you know, we, above all else, do no harm, right? But we have all taken anti-inflammatory drugs. Probably almost everybody in our class can say at one time they've taken a tile, or a, an aspirin, a, a, an NSAID of some sort, ibuprofen, a leave. And the risk, um, you know, of dying of a gastrointestinal bleed from those is somewhere in the the one in one thousand range, you know, uh, having a serious gastrointestinal event uh, that could potentially kill you. Uh, so, uh, cervical spine surgery has, you know, fifteen cases of complications out of every a thousand surgeries. So those are decent numbers right there. So uh, again, I think um, it's hard to say because the other side on this says that, you know, it's not like a lot of practitioners are going out writing up their failures. I mean, they're not rushing to do that. So it's not like if I had someone stroke out under my care that I'm going to call up JOSPT and tell them, hey, I want to hey, you to write up this this case report about how I screwed up. Um, so maybe there is underreporting. Uh, I'm, I'm tending to not believe that because of our litigious society, these things would become front page news. So uh, this is just some rudimentary actuary data that I was able to obtain. So again, actuaries like tell you how risky things are. So actuaries look at setting malpractice rates. They look at setting you know, insurance rates for people who say they go skydiving or do something like that. And they say, how risky is this? So you, you see down here that, you know, PTs pay pretty low premiums for their malpractice rates. Whereas, uh, people like cardiologists, plastic surgeons, especially, uh, OBGYN doctors play, pay much higher yearly or annual rates, uh, based off the risks that are associated with them. Okay, here we got a systematic review and meta-analysis of chiropractic care. I realize we're PTs, but since chiropractors do this manipulation skill, probably even way more than we do, um, they would be the group to maybe look at to say, okay, that's your best bet to look at who's doing this and what is happening. And so uh, the conclusion of this study, which was a, a neurosurgery group out of Penn State, uh, is that there was no convincing evidence to support a causal link between chiropractic manipulation and CAD. So um, there was a small association with it in the sense that if you were seen by a chiropractor, there was a slightly higher risk that you were going to have one of these dissections. The question again begets, is that because these people have neck pain as well and they just sought out chiropractors because chiropractors have direct access and they're very accessible. So, um, you know, again, um, this link is probably, uh, again, not supported to be causation. So here's a manual therapy article on cervical arterial dissection. Um, it basically states that these are very rare events. I think that points us more towards the one in six million type number. Um, the manipulative technique, uh, whether it is responsible, 
um, or whether just it is done in the face of a misdiagnosis is really unclear. Um, so its implications were that for patients presenting with recent onset of moderate severe unusual headache or neck pain, uh, clinicians really need to do a particular care, particularly careful history. We need to look at cardiovascular factors. We need to think about neurological symptoms, uh, things like balance deficits, visual disturbance, arm paresthesias, speech deficits, even if subtle, are, are things we need to be considering. We'll talk about how we may go about doing that. Here is an older study out of physical therapy. This was about the time I graduated in 99. And um, it said that, um, you know, this, this particular study said, you know, even though these, it agrees, the, the risks are small, um, but just because of that, we should do non-thrust type of interventions. And so, um, you know, this author concluded that the literature didn't demonstrate the benefits um, outweigh the risk of manipulation of the cervical spine. So uh, I think, you know, you're going to see these, what, what I'm trying to do with this lecture is to present what's out there. And I think you would have a therapist that might cite this very study and say, you know, hey, yeah, even though the risk is small, I just won't do this because I don't want to face that risk. And, um, you know, I, I think what you're going to see is there is probably validity to some of those arguments and on both sides. Um, but I think you want to look at the most conclusive evidence, the, the best meta-analysis and systematic reviews to say, you know, where are we getting this information? So again, this is a newer study based on Medicare beneficiaries. So these are older individuals that we think are more at risk for strokes probably anyway. And it just went back and looked at the claims and said, okay, the people who had these type of strokes, were they also billed for chiropractic services in that time? And again, this was a, um, a, a large basis of information. There was a lot of uh, claims that were examined underneath this uh, study. And so uh, it said a small difference in the risk between patients who saw chiropractors and those who saw a primary care, care physician, but it was not clinically significant, the difference. So again, that's one of those things where we have some more studies here saying, hey, these strokes happen to people that see primary care physicians and chiropractors, and there's not much of a difference between that. So uh, again, we don't link going to see your primary care physician is likely to cause you to have a stroke. So, uh, but we do say at times, you know, people have said that going to a chiropractor can cause you a stroke and this study says no. So, uh, this is a, uh, study out of a European spine journal that looked at 818 of these cases, said it was a rare event, uh, that the increased risk of, of uh, these vertebral babies or artery strokes associated with chiropractic care and PCP visits is likely due to patients with headache and neck pain from the vertebral basilar artery dissection seeking care before their stroke progressed. So, and it said they found no evidence of excessive risk associated with care, chiropractic care compared to primary care. And we do think of primary care, like seeing your family physician as being pretty safe. All right, one last, um, journal article here looking at this subject and this is out of the journal of manual manipulative therapy um, certainly linked to us as physical therapists and other clinicians uh, and so basically it says that you know traditional cardinal signs and symptoms of vertebral basilar insufficiency falling manipulative therapy are not supported by the literature that that you know these presentations are not supported. The risk is really unknown and, and based off really good data, fairly impossible for us to really quantify. So, and what, I, what it's saying by that is that there just isn't enough data to put any of this stuff together. Um, 
There was hope at one point that if we did things like Doppler ultrasounds or some sort of vascular studies to the neck, that we could also tell who was at risk and screen them for this before they saw somebody like a chiropractor or a physical therapist who did manipulation. But none of those studies seem to be actually pointing us in any better direction. So uh, this is a clinical biomechanics study saying qualifying the strain on the vertebral artery with uh, simultaneous motion analysis. And um, the study just provided us more evidence that peak strain on the vertebral artery may not occur at the end range, but at some more intermediate point in the head and neck motion. So this is not even saying that like rotation is particularly related to strain on this. So that was one of the, the, the uh, traditional models that was presented. Again, here's this animal and cadaver study um, that we talked about earlier. Um, said, you know, far greater forces than those could be created in manipulation were required to, before you saw damage to these artery walls. And, and uh, I think that's, that's, you know, it's not a human study. So it is an animal study, but I think it probably is suggestive that that is unlikely to be capable in humans. We'll examine here just what is out there on manipulation mobilization of the neck. And we do know that like low back manipulation is well supported. The conclusion of this Cochrane review, which again, another systematic review, said that mobilization or and or manipulation when used with exercises is beneficial for persistent mechanical neck disorders um, with or without headaches. So, um, it doesn't really support the manipulation alone was beneficial, but that's not how physical therapists typically apply this. We're not just, you know, popping or cracking people's necks and then sending them home. That is probably more of what happens in a chiropractic element. Uh, so we are doing both activity exercise and mobilization manipulation. So uh, that is likely that it is helping and, and there's evidence to support that. So again, here's another study that kind of came up with the same findings. Uh, again, another systematic review that there are at least short-term and, and maybe some long-term differences in pain, disability, and patient satisfaction um, when comparing manipulation or mobilization to physical therapy or exercise alone. So, um, you know, at least we can say that these two seem to work equally well um, and maybe put together uh, would be hopeful that those would be even that much more beneficial. We had mentioned this before about the evidence supporting cervical genic headache um, and the use of manipulation to treat that and I just wanted to share this study with you. So again this study had 450 subjects and it did see a decrease in pain uh, by implementing manipulation. So it's, it's, it's one of those things, again, if we had really limited value in this um, and we weren't seeing much that came out of this was good, then maybe the risk, even though they are pretty minusculely small, would say, well, but we just won't do it anyway because uh, it doesn't really do anything to help patients anyway. No, that's not the case. I mean, we are seeing evidence that manipulation, mobilization to the upper cervical spine does help people. And so um, we want to try to minimize risk, but we also don't want to restrict ourselves from doing things that do help people. So here's some efficacy um, research on um, the recommendation of the use of spinal manipulative therapy as an option of both neck and back pain and the conclusion of this uh, journal out of spine um, was that there was some confidence that that use of this is beneficial and so you know when you think of anything in research it's hard to make any definitive conclusions because the broader your your sample is 
the less likely you're hitting on any of the individuals that have specific needs for that intervention. And so for this to say that, um, you know, it's hard for research to support things. And, and when it does, it usually says there's, there's a fairly large amount of data that would support that. So uh, again, these are like data synthesis that's going on here. So again, systematic type reviews, meta-analysis reviews that said this is a viable option. So again, when we look at clinical practice guidelines for the use of manipulation in mechanical neck disorder, that the recommendations basically said that multimodal management using manipulation and manipulation plus exercise is better than, than doing it alone. And I really just think that's, that's very much what physical therapists do. And so it's, if we're going to support manipulation, it probably is physical therapists that should be doing it, not chiropractors. Uh, or chiropractors need to be doing manipulation with exercise. They need to change how they're doing some of that stuff. And I think they are in some ways. Um, but I think PTs really do have the possibility of being the better clinician to apply this treatment. And that's, again, one of the other reasons why we're going to show this to you in our class. This is an interesting study that was a basically a polling of therapists in the United States. Uh, uh, and this is uh, done by the Journal of Manual and Ministry of Therapy. And so they looked at responders to a study uh, and said, you know, do you think it's safe to do this in what areas? And so about everybody thought it was safe to do in the lumbar and thoracic area, a lower percentage still felt like it was safe in the cervical spine. Of the people who would do this thrust joint manipulation in the cervical spine, they tended to be therapists who were male. They tended to be therapists who practice in outpatient spine settings. They tended to be more aware of clinical prediction rules and have manual therapy certifications. So I'm not trying to be controversial in this information um, that's that's quoted in these results but I would just pose this question to you if you hear someone saying something negative about manipulation and its risk and the, the lack of safety is this person working in acute care or in a non outpatient setting and if they are, what is their background? Are they, are they well versed in this um, type of intervention? Or are they somebody who really doesn't have a good awareness and doesn't really have the training to do this? And thus it might be likely that they would say negative things about this because it's something they can't do. Um, Again, I, if I heard someone saying this and they do have manual therapy certifications, it wouldn't matter their gender, it wouldn't matter their you know um, time out in the field per se. I, I just I would give it more credence if they cited to me these risks based off studies and they said, well, I used to do this and I don't anymore because of this finding. I'm going to put that in a lot higher um, point of perspective. So I just am asking you as students, when you hear these things, examine and think to yourself, who's saying this? Is this person who's really probably going to be well-versed in this? Or is this person maybe perhaps just regurgitating information that's old or kind of has holes in it? Or basically just reproducing, you know, kind of propagating rumors that aren't based on evidential support. So here are um, our clinical guidelines for manipulation. Uh, and they say that uh, patient satisfaction scores did favor um, manipulation plus low tech exercises. So basically patients seem to like doing exercises they could understand easily and then having manipulation. They preferred that over manipulation by itself or over 
high-tech exercises by themselves. Now, I don't see anything in this that says, did they prefer manipulation and low-tech exercises over just low-tech exercises? But um, anyway, this study is out of, again, the Manual Therapy uh, Journal, and it was just looking at individuals' um, satisfaction rates. So even if we accept um, that the risks are low, we'd really like to be able to prevent the risk of any of these scenarios. And so this is an interesting study that, uh, of a group of authors that looked at cases that were in the literature and said, were there any factors that were listed in these cases that would have said you could have, you could have prevented this? And so basically the review said that... Um, you could prevent uh, uh, about 44% of these, uh, but there were probably 10% of these that were somewhat unpreventable, that, that were unpreventable in their, uh, at least in the facts that were presented there. So, um, you know, in the patients that, that had these in adverse reactions, there was found also to be about 26% of those patients that were being seen for something other than their neck. So it, it just maybe makes you wonder, okay, again, if I'm treating somebody for knee pain, is it worth my while to just casually perform a cervical manipulation on this person um, if they don't necessarily have any symptoms there? Right? You know, that, that certainly isn't something that seems to be supported here. Like if you were doing manipulation almost as a as a kind of a treatment that you you gave everyone or you you gave it to individuals whether they sort of presented with need for it or not so uh, i think that's again interesting that there were only 134 reported cases here linked to manipulation anyway so uh, again in all of our research out there that's a it's definitely not a high number of reported events So there is some debate about that, that uh, stroke reporting might be low because, again, the patients died um, or the clinicians didn't want to report it. Um, again, maybe, maybe this, is there this value to manipulation that, that goes away because, again, if, if, if you have any risk of dying, that outweighs the risk of doing this. Uh, again, I think the converse of all these would be that, that boy, it would be unlikely that in our current society um, that a lot of this would go unreported. Um, you would think, you know, other clinicians would start writing about these cases if indeed they were happening in a large percentage. So now we've kind of looked at this data and we've tried to say, what can we make sense out of this? Sounds like basically the, the conclusion is that the risks are low, but you can't always undo all of those risks. And now we're left to say, what do we do to try to find these people that might be coming to us with a stroke that is in progress and they have neck or head pain and we don't, we need to get them to a hospital and not miss these symptoms and not then just do what we always do and treat them for what they have, which is neck pain, by doing something that we do for neck pain, which is manipulation. So we need to look at the recommendations for vertebral basilar artery screening. This is this Australian Physiotherapy Association that put forth some of these guidelines. So the basic thing is these five D's and three N's. And I think we touched on this some in musculoskeletal one. It's a pretty easy mnemonic to remember. Dizziness, double vision, difficulty swallowing, difficulty speaking, drooping of the face, drop attacks, um, double vision, uh, dysarthria, dysphagia, this difficulty swallowing and difficulty with speech. So these are all things that uh, you should be asking questions about. Ataxia is the A, like walking with a, a drunken-like gait. Numbness, nausea, vomiting, and nystagmus. And so 
Uh, we certainly are going to treat some patients with cervical radiculopathy that have maybe numbness. Um, there's probably lower evidence for radicular symptoms being likely to respond to manipulation. That's not to say that they can't get it, but it might be one risk factor again to to look at. Uh, and again, we know nystagmus associated with vestibular type complications as well. Um, but if we're having a patient that's having any of this, even at a low level, we certainly should give pause to this. And I think if you have someone with dizziness and numbness, uh, those are probably enough right there to say, why would I do this right now? Why don't I wait and see if how this progresses or doesn't progress before I try to implement something uh, like a manipulation? So there's some other associated symptoms, again, neck pain and headaches, uh, tremors, uh, paleness, sweating, ringing in the ear, disorientation, anxiety, lightheadedness, uh, other neurological symptoms. Horner syndrome is something that is linked uh, to the potential for arterial problems. And so Horner syndrome is present with these two individuals. Uh, it is a drooping of the eyelid, sometimes an excessive uh, lacrimization or watering of the eye, and the pupil dilation will be unequal. So um, I don't necessarily think the girl's eyes there being of different color are associated with it. Uh, the other thing that you may see, and I've definitely seen some of these patients in clinical practice that have these um, birthmarks um, on their on their skin that are of a, a red or uh, a wine stained type of um, characteristic and some children are born with this uh, sometimes on their face even uh, some of those will go away with age some of them don't but if you have those then that would be another factor to put into play that perhaps there is a arterial complication. And then these arterial venous malformations are certainly associated with the risk of stroke. And basically, these are people who have mixing of their arterial and venous blood. And again, it just would say that there is some stagnation of that blood and they are more likely to have clots in general. Okay, we want to know about dizziness. We want to know if this is aggravated by neck movements or sustained positions? Does it uh, involve rolling or extension or rotation? Um, does it have a connection to their history and complaints? Uh, and how did other previous treatments affect them? If you got a person who went to a chiropractor and they got their neck manipulated and they experienced dizziness and lightheadedness and those symptoms lasted, for any long period of time or moderate even length of time, um, that's probably not a person I would be rolling the dice on and doing this sort of intervention. So if they've had a bad intervention, don't go down that road again. So how do we know whether this is BPPV or more of a VBI? Again, the, the aggravation of dizziness by neck movements or staying posture involving rotation or ex extension are thought to be maybe more VBI. Um, the, the fact that these symptoms of dizziness maybe are, are connected to uh, the onset of their neck pain. Um, and then the, just the general status of these symptoms. Have these been things that this person has had before and they've gone away? Is this uh, something that just happened after a car wreck or after a trauma? Uh, and have they had any other previous treatment? If they've just gone to see a chiropractor and they're coming in the same day to see you or the next day they've seen you, maybe you want to take all this into consideration just to be not over treating them or not treating them in a period in which you really don't know uh, are they going to progress or not? So you want to give them maybe some more time. So there were some tests that were said to be uh, good at looking at VBI symptoms. These declines test or the Hallpike Dix test uh, or George's uh, maneuver. And the conclusion on all these is those are good tests perhaps for BPPV, but not for VBI or CAD. 
And so um, really doesn't help you to do these. And then say, oh, well, the person isn't having a stroke or doesn't have vertebral basal or artery things, so I can safely manipulate them. No. Really, your 5Bds and 3N are the only thing at this point in time we really can offer you as predictors. So again, bad sensitivity, bad specificity, bad likelihood ratio, and all. Here's a, here's a position, uh, position called the Wallenberg's position in which you would just per, per put a person in extension and rotation for an extended period of time, maybe upwards of 10 seconds, and did they have symptoms on that? Uh, unfortunately, again, this test doesn't seem to have good results, um, but it's one of those things there's a question of should you be positioning these patients to see if they have any other weird symptoms um, before you do something like a manipulation anyway? It probably doesn't hurt, just to, not because we think this would predict who would have a VBI, but they might present with some other situation. I think I talked about this in musculoskeletal one, how I was having a patient just go through normal range of motion one time, had the, the gentleman extend his head. I happened to be behind him when I did that, and he passed out. And further testing revealed he had an Arnold Charia malformation where his brain stem was down in his neck. And that would definitely not have been a good person to manipulate for a different set of reasons. Uh, but again, he presented something odd that disqualified him from my treatment long before I had any real data, data about any VBI symptoms. So again, here's this International Federation of Orthopedic Manual Physical Therapists um, with some rules that say, hey, you ought to apply lower forces to the neck. Shouldn't just try to be blasting these people as hard as you can. You shouldn't do these movements at really extreme end ranges, particularly extension and rotation. And um, that these pre-manipulative test positions do give you good practice information, not because we think they'll predict who's going to have a stroke, but because we might rule out some other oddities with this. Before you go manipulate a person in a position, you ought to understand whether they even tolerate that position well in general. And then if you, if you don't do this skill uh, or you don't feel confident in this skill, that's another thing you should get this person to somebody who does if, and not be doing this if you don't feel like you're qualified to do it. Here's our cervical flexion rotation test. We look at this as a test not to detect VBI, but to detect who might have a restriction in motion and who might benefit as being a good candidate to respond to this. So there is evidence that says this is a good predictor. And here's their red light, green light, yellow light list that says, hey, if you have low risk factors, if you are exposed we can predict that you might benefit from this. Like you have symptoms that would be connected like cervicogenic headaches or you have a positive cervical rotation test. Um, then it probably is a green light that says you can go. If you've got a lot of factors that are questionable that are risk factors and we can't really connect their symptoms directly to positive outlooks for a manipulation. Why would you do that? It doesn't, it's just, you're not rolling the dice on a good bet. You're, you're placing money down on a very long shot bet and it does have some risk potentially. So I think that's a good um, thing to do. I think the red, yellow light would just say delay treatment. Just do something different. Do the exercises first. Watch them some more, see how they do with lower force stuff, and then go from there. This is JOSPT's um, reasoning, and I would just say, hey, continue to be aware uh, of the risk factors, uh, develop a really suspicious outlook, always be checking for things that look like stroke. Um, be good at doing neurological testing. Uh, and again, in cases where you have acute onsets of headaches, 
headaches that were unlike any other headaches, you ought to treat that person conservatively and make sure you are educating them about risk factors with those type of headaches. And so don't just go trying to be a hero um, if they've got something that looks suspicious. Again, those thunderclap headaches, headaches that come on suddenly, they're worse than any other uh, headache uh, that the person has experienced. Those are a risk of subdural hematomas and subarachnoid hemorrhages. And so there's a good podcast right now on the pain reframe um, a group's uh, podcast list about a physician who actually um, came down with a, or, you know, occurred a um, subarachnoid hemorrhage and her symptoms and just how the medical, uh, there was no manipulation in her case, but it was just how the medical um, community treated her and missed some of her symptoms. And she had this headache that come on suddenly and it was the worst headache of her life. So there are some other odd rumors about VBI that we ought to clear. There was some debate and some studies that said perhaps women who are on oral contraceptives have greater risk of stroke, uh, but that research has been sort of debunked and now says that uh, maybe there's only one case that that was statistically significant. Uh, but now the larger group of information says no, just because you're on oral contraceptives doesn't disqualify you from having manipulation. Are migraines a factor? They are, but not at the time the person has the migraine. So if you have a migraine sufferer, just because they're experiencing a migraine at that point would not disqualify them from having a manipulation. But realize these patients do have maybe perhaps a greater risk overall. Um, and I would just think that anybody who's having hemi paretic type symptoms, one-sided headaches that are distressing, that cause nausea and vomiting, um, if that person were to walk in my office and they have not had some workup, it, it might behoove me to go ahead and before I do that, uh, I would be better off first to wait and, and see how these symptoms progress. Uh, but again, if I'm suspicious that this is a stroke in progress, I need to get this person on for some testing. And again, we always should be applying clinical prediction rules to say, hey, before we do thrust joint manipulation, the person ought to have the criteria that says they would be likely to benefit from this. So short durations of symptoms, they don't have a negative outlook against manipulation. They have a positive one. Um, they have side to side differences in rotation. That's our cervical flexion rotation test. And um, they have uh, some discomfort when you poke on the back of their neck. You know, when, when you're palpating their vertebrae, that elicits some of their symptoms. So if you have three or four more, three out of the four, you're more likely to have a successful outcome. So uh, there's an alternative prediction rule as well that just says your neck disability index is low. So you don't have horrendous disability from your neck pain, um, that you have bilateral involvement in the sense both sides of your neck hurt. Uh, you're not doing a bunch of like office work all day long because those patients maybe are more likely to have cervicogenic uh, symptoms or suboccipital stuff and you doing manipulation may not really help them that much. Um, they don't feel worse moving their neck. They feel a little better um, and they have no report of feeling worse while extending their neck. And they um, have a diagnosis of arthritis, but it doesn't have radiculopathy. If you have four or more of those situations, then again, they're more likely to respond positive to manipulation. This is an interesting study that, that looked at low back pain. This is this Josh Cleland, who's pretty well respected, uh, Julie Fritz as well, in our field. 
Uh, John Childs is another article here. These are all fairly well-trained individuals working in this uh, GOSPT that said, if you met the criteria for clinical prediction rules and you didn't do a high velocity manipulation to those individuals, at least in lump, low back pain, the, t the patient's symptoms likely got worse, not better, uh, or, or stayed the same. So it, it was, it was a situation saying that, Hey, if you meet these criteria, that's the preferred treatment. Doing the manipulation is what you need to do to get these individuals better. And if you don't, they may not get better for a while. And so it would just say, again, if we have these patients with cervical spine problems and we're, we just don't manipulate them, there are some of those individuals that are not going to get better. And so I think we have some duty uh, if the risk of manipulation is small, very small, for having these type of bad complications, that the, the benefit does outweigh that small risk. So here is a situation that I've seen in my clinic. 32-year-old uh, female, headaches, uh, described as migraines, lightheadedness when standing up too quickly, occasional nausea. Uh, she's on oral contraceptives. Her range of motion is normal except uh, some asymmetry with the cervical rotation. She does have pain upon palpation, the C2 and C1 transverse process and spinous processes. Is this person a good bet? Well, they have a mix of symptoms, I think is what we can conclude. The oral contraceptives has been debunked. That doesn't make them... Uh, a, a candidate who shouldn't receive this. They do have some migraine symptoms, um, and that is a low f risk factor, you know, of this. Um, if you have lightheadedness when you stand up too quickly and you're a reproductive age female, more commonly than not, that's because you're a little low on hemoglobin, you're a little anemic. And so that type of dizziness is not associated with risk factors. It has an explanation. Um, nausea um, with certain odors and, and with food in the mornings is, is not an uncommon event. And so uh, all those factors really were not like large risk factors. At the very least, the, uh, or at the very most, the, the, the the uh, migraine history might just place her at, at a, like a yellow flag. Uh, but she did have asymmetrical rotation and she does have pain upon palpation. So she meets a couple of the factors in the uh, cervical prediction rule. So I would actually advocate this person is at least a good candidate for mobilization um, and, and not showing large red flags. So when treating the neck in respo response to the joints, we ought to try to produce the movements that they way, the, the way they occur naturally. So you shouldn't be, I see some, some videos out there where people put someone on their side and apply like a translational thrust joint manipulation through their neck. And that just doesn't confide to the biomechanical directionality of the neck and so I would just ask well why would you try to make the joints in the neck do something they're not designed to really do in the first place if you're doing those type of manipulations that might make you a little more risky it, it certainly just doesn't make good sense so respect the joints and the way they move and and help them move that way we're going to do this in class uh, either uh, on Wednesday or Friday but I want to just make you aware of some practical demonstrations of saying, of showing you where would be the boundaries for minimizing stress and where are some areas maybe you might be putting more stress on the neck. Uh, and we'll just try to stay within confines of, of good uh, cervical spine um, management. So um, overall, uh, I think those are things we can, we can help show you in this class. Last thing we'll show you here is this slide that the life is more risk management than an exclusion of risk. Um, I, I, I'm not trying to influence you necessarily 
pro or con with this PowerPoint and this discussion. I just think we owe it to all of you to share with you what is out there. And I think it is worthwhile to consider whether some of these extraneous turf wars and conflict amongst different practitioners has, has potentially contributed to some of the negative connotation associated with manipulation in the cervical spine. I think it's also absolutely our duty to our patients, our profession, and ourselves to know and stay up to date on all the literature about this, especially if this is something you plan on utilizing your in your uh, clinical practice. Um, I do agree with this statement. I I do manipulation, and and I recognize that there is some risk that I'm taking in that, but I do not do manipulation without ever performing those five D's and three N's questions. And I'm always looking for those factors uh, in their clinical presentation. If anything looks odd, I'm going to, I'm going to hold out and wait for another day. And so um, that's our opinion. I think you as practitioners need to listen to this and go do your research yourself and then make informed choices whether this is something you feel comfortable with doing or not. But I don't think we get anywhere without knowing the facts. And so that's our hope in giving this PowerPoint. So we'll talk more about this in class and uh, have a discussion. Thanks for listening.